Hello everybody, it is Nick here with another Nick's Topics Dragon Ball What If Topic video for you guys today. And today, we are getting in to part 15 of What If Nom Became Z Fighter. Now, we are approaching the end of this series, going into the Tournament of Power arc. To recap the last episode in short terms, we ended the Universe 6 vs. 7 tournament, with Universe 7, ultimately like before, being the winners, and the end of the tournament playing out as you would expect, with Goku and Zeno and all that fun stuff. And I discussed Zamasu's arc and why it ultimately would be cut short. You want more context? Just watch my past part for more of that. Anyways, we ended off the episode with the Grand Priest announcing the Tournament of Power, because since the future timeline in the Goku Black original arc isn't relevant here, the one Zeno that remains in the present timeline is much more bored, so the Tournament of Power is put into place much sooner. But who will be part of the team in this scenario? Well, Goku, for one, obviously, and speaking of whom, he has had a lot more practice with the likes of Ultra Instinct Omen after getting the handle on Blue Kaioken. Now, how has he had this certain upgrade already? Well, you see, in my Giren and Hercules stories, because of the extra influence of another character, that means that Goku's growth is exponentially higher, depending on whom the character entails. And Tien and Nam, who are also being in the tournament, because obviously, they have already had practice with Ultra Instinct way earlier than Goku because Beerus, seeing their potential when he met them on the Kai planet, realized that Ultra Instinct was the real only thing, if they were to train on his planet, that these two could obtain, and thought that they could use this quite effectively from what he saw of their powers. So Goku seeing this bribed him to train with it sooner, and thus we have a more experienced Ultra Instinct Omen Goku. Besides the three of them being in the tournament, Krillin is going to take part, Master Roshi, besides this one relevant scene from Resurrection F, gets to take a stand in the tournament like before, Piccolo's obviously going to be in, Gohan, who's had god key training as well, and Yamcha. But wait, Nick, that leaves two spots. Who is going to be the two contenders? Because you've had this happen before, and... It was part of your Giren story with Mecha Frieza and Nail. But who's going to take part with so many other changes in this story? Well, I'm going to take a page out of my What If Giren Became a Z Fighter, and since Nail is still around, that means that we can put him into some more relevance now at this point in the story. And. I'm going to say that the whole thing with him and Piccolo fusing with Planet Namek, Sino and Perina from Universe 6, basically, were the first ones to do that. And like my Giren story, we now have a much more powered up Nail and Piccolo fusing with the might of Planet Namek. Like I said, few things taken out of my Giren story, because with all of the plot points being there, there's no point in not giving them some kind of leg up, especially for the Tournament of Power. Now, who is the one other spot going to go to? Well, it's going to be Vegeta. Vegeta, Nick? Why? You could have picked any other person, and compared to everyone else, Vegeta's weak. What relevance would he bring? Well, you see, besides my Hercule story... Vegeta has not had much relevance as of my past two stories. So, I thought to throw Vegeta a bone here at this point, because if you really think about it, in my other Giren story, if Vegeta were brought back right now, we could see him, if he was training in the likes of Hell, a much more stronger Saiyan. He's not going to have, like, God Key or anything, obviously, 
But especially for the Tournament of Power, since they brought back the likes of Frieza, it fits the stones perfectly that if Vegeta were to have died way earlier on, that he would be the next in line that I think Goku would think about. And just to show off the Prince of the Saints, one of the most popular Dragon Ball characters. Anyways, Fortune Teller Baba, as well as the Dragon Team, are not as mad at Goku or surprised at him requesting Vegeta, because he's no Frieza, and everybody could take him on easily, whereas Frieza was a whole nother story in the original lore. Anyways, we see that the likes of Goku going into the actual hell, and not just Frieza's version of hell, to meet up with Vegeta, who at this point is training, because Saiyan. And after meeting him and explaining everything that's gone on, Vegeta then demonstrates that he has achieved Super Saiyan and can even go a level beyond, which we know to be Super Saiyan 2, because he has been stuck in hell for a long time ever since he was killed off in the Saiyan arc. So for him to have Super Saiyan 2 even would not be that much of a far statement. And he says that he is willing to join the team on the condition, sort of like Frieza, that he gets brought back to life after. And Goku is not nearly as pressed about this decision as he was with Frieza because Vegeta didn't ultimately kill anybody, except Yamcha. But that was more or less the Cybermen, not really him. Anyways, we get to the scene where Fortune Teller Baba brings Vegeta to Earth and everything is put into arrangement for Goku and Vegeta to go back to the team and for them to go to the World of Void. But we get to another little problem. The Universe 9 Assassins. I do not know if I was br bringing them up to much relevance in the Garen story as much as I should have, but if I did, then it would ultimately be cut short in that regard because of Mecha Gold and Frieza. Um, you guys can clarify that for me in the comments if I did or not. Anyways, aside from me rambling on about that little story, Vegeta compared to the Universe 9 Assassins, with the powers of Super Saiyan 2 at his disposal and a lot of training with it, even though he's far weaker than True Golden Frieza, he could still beat up the Assassins something fierce. But when we get to the Universe 9 Assassin leader, he's actually able to hold his own much more effectively because, let's see, the thing with Frieza, he just blasted all of them with death beams just over and over again. He didn't, like, go all out against them or come up close. And this plays more to the Universe 9 Assassin's leader's advantage. Not only is he able to fend off Vegeta much more effectively than Frieza that he ever would, but he also gets to see some openings in which he can strike with the Hakai energy. Now, how does this Vegeta fare against this energy? <laughs> he is absolutely not any kind of match. The minute the Hakai ball pierces Vegeta, he is shouting, writhing in pain. He can't even think to get out of it. It's just so much pain. He might have seen what Kakarot and everybody else was up to for the most part, but most of the time he didn't even care, even when it gets to the likes of God training because he was too focused training by himself. But this also plays to Goku's advantage of this being a surprise whenever he goes into his Super Saiyan God form, takes out the leader, and ultimately frees Vegeta because he still needs Vegeta's help. Now, after this... He gives Vegeta a sensu bane, and it takes a good moment for the prince to register what the crap just happened, because he's never experienced any kind of energy, and this energy of, of that Universe 9 Assassin's leaders is all too familiar to a certain somebody. A certain someone that shows up right then, Beerus and Whis, at the time where Goku was caught in the ball by Frieza. And this is the moment where Beerus and Vegeta meet for the first time, ever since Vegeta was a kid. After regaining his composure, after the whole Akai Ball incident and Beerus being a thing, Vegeta now remembers 
that Kakarot just used this god power and that he must have been training with Beerus all this time. And he is angry. Not only was he sneak attacked by Pess, using the powers of a destroyer god against him, but now Kakarot comes along with the Super Saiyan god power, and he wants it for himself. He demands to get the god power within him, or he will refuse to join the team. He is being very persistent. But he didn't really think about how this, in turn, would affect Beerus, and Beerus is in no kind of mood for this blasphemous act from Vegeta. He, they don't have time for the god training. And ultimately, Vegeta has to just go with it. He can't do anything. Now, the team is set for the Tournament of Power. And we get to the team arriving at the World of Void and the entrance itself into the tournament. But how will it play out with so many changes in character development? Well, you'll have to wait for next time because that's where we're leaving things for the moment. Now, I now that we're getting into the Tournament of Power itself, I we're getting close to the end of the story. So, I can't estimate what part this series will officially end. It could be the next part, could be the part after. It will definitely be one of the two, but for now, regardless, I hope that you guys are enjoying the series and all my other videos as of now. What did you guys think about this episode and Vegeta basically being more relevant at this point? And how do you think he'll fare in the tournament itself? Leave a comment, like, and subscribe if you enjoyed. And I'll see you guys next time.